There's a story told of a man who worked at a factory, and one of his duties was every day he was to blow the whistle for lunch. And uh, this was a really important job for two reasons, because the boss didn't want it blown a minute early, and the workers didn't want it blown a minute late. So a lot of pressure on him. And so every day as he walked to work, he would pass a jewelry store. And in the old days, jewelers typically had a big clock that was very near the front window of the store. And so every day as the man went by, he would take out his pocket watch, he would check the time, and he would adjust it so that it was with this clock, and then every day he would blow the whistle. Story says that one day he was walking by the jewelry store and there were no customers in there, but the owner was. So the guy decided he would stop and to figure out how this man always knew the right time. And so he stopped in and he said, just want to know, how do you keep your clock set? And the man said, well, that's easy. Uh, There's a factory across town and every day at noon, there's a whistle that blows and I adjust my clock accordingly. That story demonstrates standards, time, and it demonstrates that sometimes you can think you've got the right standard, but there may be some suspicion to that. And so we think about standards in everyday life. We don't use the term maybe that often, but yet we all have them. This is the foundation of our beliefs. This is what everything is built on. And so in your job or your career, it's likely that from time to time you have to review the standards. Uh, In schools, when you go through recertification, you have to sit down and you got to go through your standards and make sure that they're right. And what that then does is it means that this is how everything's going to be interpreted. What you do, what you practice, what you believe in, Everything that you are interpreting within your world is going to be based on the standards that you have. And so that brings us to a term. I don't know if it's a new term or not. It seems like I've only been hearing it used in the past few years. But the idea of the worldview, maybe a decade ago it was called the meta narrative, but same idea. And I've taken a definition from a man by the name of Ronald Nash, because I think he really concisely gets it, when he defines a worldview as a conceptual scheme by which we consciously or unconsciously place or fit everything we believe and by which we interpret and judge reality. So let's put all that together now. The standard that you have is how you are interpreting events around you. And that becomes your worldview by the fact that either you're conscious of it or just in everyday life, maybe without giving, a little, uh, giving it very much thought, you are determining how things ought to be in this worldview based on your standards. And what we must understand is that while we may not be in agreement on the worldview, everybody's got a worldview. Everybody's got a worldview. Because by this definition, what it's saying is, is this is how I'm living my life. This is how I'm deciding what to do. This is how I'm determining right from wrong. This is how I'm determining my practices. Standards, interpretation, lead to a worldview. Now this morning, what I want to do is to focus that in on the concept of a biblical worldview. Again, this is a term that seems fairly new to me, one that that I don't know that I heard very much up until just a few years ago, but I think it's a good term because what a biblical worldview is stating is that everything that I'm deciding, everything I believe, everything I practice, the way I treat other people, the way I treat the world around me, is going to be based on what I can find within the Word of God. So we would think that a worldview, a biblical worldview, would be a very constant among Christians. That that would be something that at least everyone who professes to believe in Jesus would agree to. Let me show you something though. In 1990, around 90% of Americans identified themselves as Christians. 
In 2023, that number has fallen to 65%. Now, let me just say, within any statistic, there are lots and lots of nuances and stories, but I think that gives us a fairly clear picture. And I think it helps to explain as we look around the world and we think, why is everything falling apart all at once? It's really not. This has been a 30-year downward trajectory. All right, so 65%, that's still a fairly significant number, though. But let's add this to it. In the United States, there are only 6% of Americans who state that they have a biblical worldview. Now, that's not a real surprise amongst the general population until you start thinking that 65% of Americans classify themselves as Christians, yet only 6% say that everything is seen and decided through a biblical worldview. And I think we can understand that by the next statistic, that in the larger realm of of those who identify themselves as Christians, only 37% of the people who stand before these groups hold a biblical worldview. I want you to think about that for a minute. So what that means this morning in the United States, as sermons like this are being presented, only 37% of the people presenting them, if these statistics are correct, believe that it's appropriate to have a biblical worldview in teaching, in admonishing, and encouraging. And so what we're seeing is is that if we do indeed hold a biblical worldview, we are not only in a minority, we are in a super minority and even a super minority within those who would profess belief in Jesus Christ. So as we think about that this morning, we need to understand that there's a fair amount of pressure on all of us to say that the Bible might be good, but it's not complete in showing us how to live. But I hope what I can do this morning is that from the Bible show you that that's an erroneous idea. That what God is saying is, is that everything is determined through the lens of the Word of God, through what He's given to us. So as we approach that, let's just start out with what a biblical worldview looks like. And if you'd like, you can go ahead and turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And as we look here, Paul is in his final writings, perhaps that we have recorded, very likely. He's giving some final written instructions to Timothy. And he's talking to Timothy a bit about how he, Timothy, has grown up and what that means. And so if you look, uh, beginning in about verse 14 or so, he says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it, and how that from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, does that sound like a biblical worldview? This is something that from childhood you've known. This is something that's based on the sacred writings in which you have been instructed. And what he does then is he begins to show how this biblical worldview needs to be put into application into Timothy's life. And so the first thing he says is, look, you need to understand where this word comes from. And so he follows then in verse 16 by saying, all Scripture is breathed out by God or inspired by God. And so what the apostle is saying is, is when you open the Word of God, you need to have the confidence that this is the mind of God being revealed to you. This is not just a series of good writings. These are things that are from God Himself. Now he's going to follow that then by saying, and in so reading and practicing these things, this is how it's going to be profitable for you. He says, first of all, it's going to be profitable in teaching. Or maybe the older word there would help us out in doctrine. When we use that word doctrine today, the connotation of it is these are the things that we're establishing as right and wrong. 
This is the way we are to practice certain things. So if someone were to ask you, what is your doctrine of salvation? Then what you would say is, this is what I believe about it. So the apostle is telling Timothy, when you've got this biblical worldview and you realize and appreciate that all of this is inspired by God, then you're going to know what to do. He's going to tell you the doctrine, the teachings that you're to hold. He then says, it's going to be profitable for reproof. Now in English, reproof can have a negative connotation to it. If we are reproved, then sometimes that means we've been straightened out. But there's a second idea, and I think that's the one the Apostle is using here, that he's saying when you go to the Word, there's plenty within the Word to show you that it's believable, to show you that it is legitimate to have faith in what it's saying. Now here's the thing, you can't go to another source and line it up with the Bible and decide from this other source whether the Bible's true or not. Uh, it, it would be an apples and oranges kind of thing. And so what must be done is to take the Bible and to determine whether or not these things make sense, whether or not there's a legitimacy about them. And the apostle tells Timothy, when you take the Word of God, God's included that. He's shown you the things within it that will make that clear. And then he says it's profitable for correction. Here's where we do get off track. And so we're looking and, and we see where we're living. We're looking at our judgments. We're looking at our thoughts, our words, our actions. And then we compare them to the Word of God. And when we see that we're kind of out of kilter with that, God says, the Word of God will bring you back into line. It's going to put you back on the proper course. So it's good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. And then He says... It's profitable for training in righteousness. We understand in the world of athletics that if you are going to be good at what you do, there's got to be a lot of training. Whether that's running every morning, whether that's hitting a ball, whether that's kicking a ball, whatever. you got to keep at it. you got to train. And that's this idea. And so he's saying it's not just about correcting, it's also putting you on the right track. It's helping you to understand that this is how your faith grows. All right, now take all this together, and this is a biblical worldview. The message is from God. What He tells you to do is included. How you can know this is true is included. How you can get back if you've fallen is included. How you can grow in your faith is included. And then within the context of this passage, He says, here's the results of when you adopt a worldview, he started out with it. He said, first of all, it's going to make you wise for salvation. How do I know what this life is all about? How do I know how to reach a relationship with God? How do I know that I'm going to be eternally saved? Paul says, have a biblical worldview. It'll show you that. It'll make you wise for salvation. And then at the conclusion of this, down in verse 17, after going through all these profitable things, he says that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work. So if I'm going to live as God wants me to live competently, in other words, I'm doing it in the right way, and I'm equipped for the work that God's given me to do, Paul is saying, go to your Bible. You're going to find it there. He's telling Timothy, as a man of God, and he may be using that term in this, this particular place and preaching the gospel, he's saying you look to the Word of God, that's where it's going to be found. All right, so that's one. Let's look at a second example. Still looking at the Apostle Paul, but this time let's go over to Acts 26. Acts chapter 26. Here the Apostle is on trial and he's giving his testimony and what we're going to see here is what a biblical worldview looks like in action. So as he's being questioned, he makes sure to note that the Word of God is his standard. Here in chapter 26, look down to the latter part of verse 22. He says, I'm testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. All right? He's, he's making his testimony. He's standing here. He, he's got people who are doubting him. 
And he says, all I'm doing is going by the standard that's been revealed to me. This is the, the Bible message. He follows then by saying, I've accepted this standard's conclusions. So I've read the, the writings of the prophets and Moses that this would come to pass. Then in verse 23, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, He would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. What's the conclusion of what's been written? Paul says, when I put it all together, what we might call, this is the big picture of the Bible. Right? That we spent a while, uh, a few weeks ago, studying that. He's saying the big picture of the Bible, everything that the, Mo that the prophets and Moses have been writing about is fulfilled in the fact that Jesus has come, lights come into the world, and now Jew and Gentile can be saved through Him. In this, he says, that's reasonable. Remember we said the reproof? There, there's evidence there that this is true. So he, he's been accused. Festus has said, Paul, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. You, you've studied too much. But in verse 25, Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I am speaking true and rational words. Now that's important. Paul is saying, yeah, I've studied it. And what I'm presenting to you is a rational view of what I've studied. There's, there's proof that Jesus is true because of all these things that have been stated. And he tells them, I don't change this with the audience. If you back up to verse 22, he says, To this day, I have had the help that comes from God so that I am here testifying both to small and great. Whether I'm standing before kings or governors or the common man on the street, my message does not change because it comes from the Word of God. And he says, I'm willing to accept the outcome of that. Verse 21, for this reason... The Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. As Paul interpreted the things that are going on, he says, this has resulted from the fact that I have taken a biblical worldview. And so whether he's writing to Timothy or whether he's talking about a time in his life, what he's saying is everything is coming through the Word of God. And that's what we need to understand. So that when we think about having this biblical worldview, we first of all understand that we can believe that the Bible is inspired and true. That idea is quickly falling away. Quickly falling away. But what you and I must understand is that by the simple fact that after all these years of testing and being attacked, that here in the year 2023, the Bible is still standing strong. Evidence has been there from outside things, archaeology, things that we found historically. They support it, but the idea, the big idea, is that no one has been able to dismantle the Bible, though many, many have tried. So if I'm going to have this biblical worldview, I've got to have a keen appreciation for that, that what I'm reading is from the Word of God, and that this is how I come to know God. We would have no idea about who God is if this is not true. Now, we might come to a conclusion there is a greater power out there. We might think there's somebody or something or some things that are guiding behind the scenes, but we would have no idea. So the Word of God, if it is accepted as true, is going to show us about the God in the Bible who is the true source of that authority. So then, like the Bible, we can say He's been proven true. He's been, he's been proven faithful in all things. And we would then add to that, that if those are indeed the case, that everything I believe, every attitude I hold, every word I speak, every action that I conduct, must be filtered through the Word of God. 
And so that means if the doctrine is there, I follow it. If the command is there, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to change it. But there are occasions when God will tell us, I've not given you uh, a specific black and white answer for everything in life, yet I've given you the principles in which you can make good judgments. And so if it's up to me to determine something, I'm not left on my own. I've got the principles, I've got the, the, the examples within the Word of God, and everything I'm doing, everything is being filtered through that faithful Word of God. That's what a biblical worldview looks like. What we need to understand, though, as we said in the beginning of the lesson, is that this is very much under attack. The idea that the Bible is, is the true and inspired Word of God and that everything we've just said is true is, is believed by very few. So what are the detriments to that? Well, we don't have to go very far in the Bible to find an example of one of those detriments. When we look in the beginning, we find that in chapter 3 of Genesis, the biblical worldview is under attack. As the serpent comes in and begins addressing Eve, he says this, Did God actually say, planting the seed of doubt? Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And then a few verses down, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. God may have told you that, but, but it's not going to happen. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Look at the two things that he did here. First of all, he said, you can't trust God. You, you can't trust Him. There are things He may tell you, and He's insecure. He's afraid you're going to be like Him. He doesn't want that. You can't believe Him. And then He plants a second idea, and He says, because really, God is so restrictive, He doesn't want you to be happy. God's put all these rules and regulations into place, and if you really believe all of that stuff, you're going to live this terrible, miserable life, and that's where God wants you. Does that sound a little familiar? that these ancient arguments are as current and relevant now as they have ever, ever been. So that's one that's been with us a very long time. Secondly, though, it's a biblical misrepresentation that we're going to find the danger of an idea being said to be in the Bible, but that idea really isn't there. So many times, uh, things that are traditional will sound really, really biblical. We talked about one of those a few weeks back uh, where we talked about the phrase accepting Jesus as your own personal Savior has been used so much, many think it's in the Bible, but you'll never find it there. Well, that's, that's kind of the idea. Let me illustrate it like this. When we think about a spectrum, on one end of that spectrum, we might think that here are churches who will say, look, now authority is you can do anything that the Bible does not forbid. As long as God said not to do it, you can do it. Well, we understand, right? There's a lot then that we're perhaps putting into that that ought not to be there. And in our minds, we think, well, here on the other end of the spectrum... Here are those who are saying, well, the only way you can be right is if you follow our rules. The rules that we've laid down, if you follow these things, you'll be okay. You'll be right with God. But here's what I want us to understand. That both of those ignore the Bible. That really what we're seeing is both of these ideas on one end of the spectrum. Because neither of them are using the Bible as their authority. One of them is saying, well, as long as it's not forbidden, we got free, uh, free reign to do what we want. On the other hand, you've got people saying, well, we're going to make rules based on what the Bible says, and we're going to require you to follow those rules for salvation, and both of them are ignoring the Word of God. How do we know what we're to do? How are we to know what churches are to do? It's right here. By command and principle, we find that. So then, we go to our third reason. 
And that's a term that might not be terribly widely used. Syncretism simply means that it's the blending of ideas to create one's preferred worldview. Then in other words, you, as we said, everybody's got a worldview. So you're kind of taking what you want out of those and you're creating your own. I want to illustrate to you what that looks like. <clears throat> there was a big, big biblical spiritual research project done by the Barna Group last year. And they polled people to say, okay, do you consider yourself a born-again Christian? And we'll not go through all the definitions of that term. But these are people who went on to say that the Bible is accurate and reliable. This is the accurate and reliable Word of God. So we would say they profess a biblical worldview. 74% of those who classified themselves as born-again Christians said this about the Bible. But I want to show you some things. In this study, 56% of this group said having faith matters more than which faith you pursue. Now let that soak in for a minute. A group that's saying that the Bible is accurate and reliable is saying the Bible is not really that accurate or reliable at all. You can choose whatever faith you want. 54% said feelings, experience, Input of friends and family is the most trusted source of moral guidance. Feelings, experience, input of friends are important. But listen to what they're saying. They're saying it is the most trusted. Not the Word of God. 51% said all religious faiths are equal. Whether that's Buddhism whether that's Islam, whether that's Christianity, everything's equal. 50% said the Holy Spirit is not real. It's what we talked about last week, but merely a symbol of God's power. So, of this category, half or better of those who say we hold a biblical worldview believe these things. This next one, I think, will rise significantly in the next few years. Right now, 40% believe there is no absolute moral truth. So you can't determine what's right or wrong other than how everybody feels about the situation. 37% said if a person is good enough or does enough good things, he or she can earn their way to heaven. Completely negates the work of Jesus Christ. If I am good enough to earn my way to heaven... There is, is no use for the blood of Jesus. Now that's people classifying themselves as Christians. And then 31% said that the Bible is ambiguous on abortion. Now if we put these just in the broader population, it wouldn't be very shocking. What's shocking is are people who are professing a worldview stating these things. And so what we're seeing that syncretism does then is it says that the lack of biblical support really doesn't constitute a contradiction. Though the Bible may say that Jesus is the way, there's really lots of ways. So you see what happens? That personally blended preferred worldview is hiding the truth of the Scriptures. So with all that said then, how do we stay true to the biblical worldview? I don't think it's any surprise to us, is it? We've got to read and we've got to understand the Bible. Now, I want to make this point. The Bible is an amazing book, but it is a complex book. We never need to enter the Bible, our Bible study saying, this is just easy stuff. No, <laughs> there are big ideas, challenging ideas in it. I think I've got some ample proof of that. 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes, as Paul does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. Here is one apostle speaking of another apostle's writings. And he says, when you read those things, there's some tough stuff in that. There's some challenging things within that. But notice what he says. He, he doesn't say, so just develop your own worldview about it. He says, no, what happens is ignorant and unstable twist these things to their own destruction as they do with other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away. 
Just because something is hard doesn't mean we can ignore it. Just because something is hard, we can say, I don't want to study that. That's not important to me. Peter is saying that is exactly what you need to be studying. Because what will happen is someone will come along and they'll twist it and make you think it's the right thing, just like all these things we looked at, that you're really on the right track. So the Bible is a book written for us to ponder over and think about and meditate on and talk to one another about. That's how we're going to come to this full biblical worldview. Let me add one other to this. And it's not failing to make sure we're asking God for help in this. We need to be praying for wisdom. Do you do that on a regular basis? I can't say that in my life I've always done that, but I've sure tried to do that in later years. That when James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously and without reproach, and it will be given him. When we're reading those hard things the Apostle Paul wrote, when we're reading in the Old Testament all these prophecies of ancient times, Are we praying about those things for insight, for clarity, for companions that can help us to understand those things better? That's how we read and understand the Bible. That's how we have this biblical worldview. Let me add this also. We need to beware the notion that a biblical worldview is unloving. Unfortunately, in our day and time, We're being told that if we hold certain views, that we're just bad people. And probably a whole lot of that has led to the departure from a true biblical worldview. But that is just simply not the case. Changing the standards of God certainly does not produce a genuine love. It's just the opposite. When I am willing to compromise my beliefs to appease someone else, I have made that person my God. My worldview is pleasing those around me and not God Himself. So no matter which direction society goes, no matter which direction perhaps even Christians are going to go, you and I have got to make the commitment that we are a people dedicated to God fully believing that His Word is true and letting that Word guide us in the things that we do. I appreciate the songs that John led this morning and I think we're about to lead, I think he's about to lead us in one that in the chorus is going to say, this is my story. You know what that means? This is my worldview. This is my song praising the Savior all the day long. How do we show that praise? It's in our worship. But how else do we show it? It's by being faithful to Him. By saying, I believe that what you have said is true. So this morning, if you've been pondering over the Bible, and you've determined that this is true, and that when God says the way to salvation is to acknowledge that, that I am the way, As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And that coming to Him and and accepting that grace and mercy is going to be found by obedience to Him in the waters of baptism where He said, it's there you'll die with me and be buried with me and be resurrected with me. And to come out of those waters committed to Him by faithfully following what He said to do then that means you've got a worldview that's going to be an eternal worldview. And that will mean that you'll be saved not only now, but in the age to come. Maybe you've strayed from that and we can pray with you about it. You've you've gone on paths that don't hold this view. Whatever it takes, let's make sure that we're right with God and that we are true believers and true followers of what He said. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, you can come now while we stand and sing together.